Hey, who, who remembers a guy called Julius? Anyone remember a man called Julius? Yes. What do you know about Julius? What do you remember about Julius? He's a centurion? Yep. Yes, that's right. He had to take Paul on a boat. Well done. Two people were listening. That's awesome. Awesome. That's better. Some weeks it's only one. Um, so last week we talked about this guy called Julius, Acts chapter 27, I'm not going to go back into it, you can jump on the YouTube channel and have a look, but in Acts chapter 27 we've got this story of a centurion called Julius, you probably never heard a message on Julius, I hadn't heard a message about Julius, uh, but I stumbled across this guy called Julius, and Julius had the job of escorting Paul, the apostle, uh, used to be a guy called Saul once upon a time, hated Jesus, was anti-Jesus, was trying to crush the church, uh, and had this amazing encounter on a road to a city called Damascus. A light shone before him, and his voice said, uh, who do you think you're dealing with here? And uh, Saul was affronted by the reality of the fact that Jesus, who was crucified uh, previously and actually apparently supposedly rose from the dead, and the Bible tells us was seen by many, uh, Saul was confronted with the fact that maybe this actually is true and this did happen because the resurrected Jesus appeared before him and revealed himself to him. So Saul went from being this massive persecutor of the Christian faith, trying to destroy this movement that you and I are a part of that used to be called The Way, to being somebody that became its greatest proponent and took the good news of Jesus across to different nations and places, planted many churches. And so he was uh, heading off to Rome where he would eventually be beheaded for his faith. He could have gone out of that quite simply. All, all, the, all these uh, uh, disciples and apostles had to do to avoid the death that they faced was to simply say, haha, just joking. Never really saw Jesus. He's not, he was not raised from the dead. But they couldn't say that because they believed that to be true. And so these guys went on and physically gave their lives for that faith. And this little movement called The Way grew to be what we now know as the church, which is billions of people, every continent, tribe, nation, language, and tongue. And because of their faith and their commitment to that message, we're sitting here today. Isn't that pretty awesome? Yeah, well, a couple of people think so. That's good. I, I, I think it's pretty awesome um, that we're sitting here on the back of what men and women have done, uh, standing on their faith, not wavering, not shying away, not pulling back, but believing and walking forward in faith, even in spite of dire consequences at times, which many believers, our brothers and sisters around the world, are facing even now. So anyway, last week we talked about Julius, and Julius had the task of taking Paul to Rome. Now, Julius was about to put Paul on a ship, and of course, uh, Paul, speaking by the Holy Spirit, said to Julius, if, you, if we get on that ship, this is going to be very, very bad. We're going to lose lives, we're going to lose cargo, don't do it. But at the same time, when the Holy Spirit was speaking through Paul to Julius, the ship's captain said, no, no, this is a good idea, we can do this. And then it says the owner of the ship also said, no, we're going to go ahead and do this. And then it says, then a majority of the people on the ship agreed together and said, no, no, we're going to go and do this. So Julius is standing there, he's got the voice of God, the Holy Spirit speaking through Paul, but he's got the voice of the captain, he's got the voice of the, the owner of the ship, and he's got the voice of the, the multitude and the majority, and he's... Got all these voices coming at him. And how many of you know in life we have all kinds of voices coming at us? At the end of the day, we have to make decisions, don't we? We have to make decisions in life. We have to take steps in certain directions. And we've got to process all this myriad of voices that are screaming at us and try to discern which of these voices is the voice of God, therefore the one worth following. Well, we know the story that Julius didn't listen to Paul. They went out, and it was exactly as Paul had said, and a big storm whipped up, and they lost all the cargo. But an angel appeared to Paul, and Paul said, uh, said to Paul, you know what, you're, not, you're going to lose all the cargo, but because of, of, of Paul's presence on that ship and the mission of God, I've got to get you to Rome. I'm going to spare the lives of the passengers. Up until this point, Julius isn't really interested in listening to Paul. He's too busy listening to everybody else. But when Paul came the second time and said, okay, an angel's appeared to me and said, Let's, we're going to lose all the cargo, but there's going to be no loss of life. You need to listen to me. All of a sudden, uh, he decided that he would start listening to the voice of Paul, which is not unlike many of us. We think we know best, and we trudge our way through life. We get ourselves into all kinds of storms and messes that God originally didn't intend for us, but we land there anyway, and that's amazing how people cry out to God in the midst of a storm. All of a sudden, we want to listen to him, don't we? All of a sudden, we, 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 our ears are open, and we want to hear from God. And, and if, if we could learn to hear from God before we got there, I wonder what our lives could be like. Amen? 
God is trying to lead us to good places. So last week we talked about Julius. Reminded me of a story of a young girl. I was speaking on a Youth of the Mission training school uh, out back Queensland somewhere. It was a, a travelling school that went about. And uh, so they, they, they took me out there for a week to teach this group of international uh, missionaries in training. And one afternoon, it was in the middle of summer. It was really hot and we were out in the middle of Queensland somewhere. And so one afternoon, we decided to go to a waterhole to have, have a swim. So we went to this waterhole to have a swim and we're there and there's this big tree and it's all barren ground and then a rock, uh, the, the creek, creek's down here but on the way down to the creek there's these big massive boulders on the edge of this mud flat sort of thing and then the water and, and we were getting on the rope swing and we were swinging right out past the rocks then you let go and bang, splash in the water, yippee doo dah, we're all having fun, nice and cool, it's about 38 degrees, something was terrible. There was this one girl and she, they were saying, the crowd was saying to her, hey come on you have a swing. I knew straight away that she was unsure about whether she should do this. You ever been in a situation like that? You're unsure about whether you should do something, but you've still got all these voices encouraging you and telling you you should do this or go this way or go that way, and you're a little uncertain. Well, this girl, I could tell she was uncertain. So I'm trying to say to her, you know what, I think you should do what you feel you should do. What do you think? But the rest of this crew that were her peers that she'd done this training school with them, they knew her better than me, and they were all going, no, no, come on, you can do this. You're a winner. You're a champ. Come on, you can do this. Come on, you know? And so anyway, in the end, she decided. She grabbed the rope. She got up the top of the thing and she's hanging on to the swing and I literally turned away and started praying because I was afraid, literally, that I was going to witness somebody dying in front of me. She lifted her feet and swung and then after about a metre, realised she'd made a mistake, put her feet on the ground. They clipped the rock, she let go of the rope and she just went head, feet, head, feet and she rolled about 15 metres down this thing. Everybody held their breath. There's big boulders and rocks everywhere. By the grace of God, she somehow never hit a single rock and just splashed face first in the water. And then she got up and she was doing that. You know, when you, you don't know whether to laugh or to cry, you're like, <laughs> she's doing that, you know, and everyone's gathering around her and they're patting her on the back and saying, you're so brave. Oh, look at you, you're so brave. And I was thinking, and I never said it, but I'm thinking, you are not brave. That was really, really stupid. That was really, really stupid. Because you know deep down inside, you had a sense inside of you that you shouldn't do that. But you listened to all these other voices and you went and did it anyway and it could have cost you badly. But praise God, the worst was that she just had some cuts and grazes and of course was highly, highly embarrassed at the end of the whole process. So last week, I had a couple of young guys come up to me at the end of the service, and they asked me a really good question, and I'm glad they asked it, because that's exactly what I want to speak on today. Unfortunately, I don't think those young guys are here today, so don't ask me next week. Go back and watch YouTube. So the question they asked me was this, how do you know the God is speaking to you? How do you know if God's speaking to you? How, um, there, there's so many voices and noises and sounds coming at us. How do we actually know if God is speaking to us? There are three things that, I'll just go through these real quick. There are three things that are pretty clear in Scripture. Number one, we know that God leads his people. We know that. We can go back from, from, from Genesis 1-1 to the end of Revelation. You will see God leading his people. Uh, one of my favorite verses of God's leading is Psalm uh, chapter 23, verse 1 and 2. I think we've got it there. Psalm 23, verse 1 and 2. It says this, it's David writing. He says, the Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. What a, what, you could preach for a year on that. What a beautiful thought. The Lord, the Lord, there's only one, the Lord, over everything is your and my shepherd. What a great thought. And verse 2, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. So God leads me to places. And I love the imagery here. God leads me to quiet waters. God, God leads me to green pastures. It, it says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will not fear evil. I'll find myself at times in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death. I'll find myself at times in the midst of difficulties and, and hard circumstances. I will find myself at times even being led into storms by God. We've got a story of that with the disciples where they got on a boat with Jesus and they went out and a storm raged and the disciples were asleep on the boat. You remember that? Jesus knew the storm was coming, but he went to sleep. They wake up Jesus and say to him, don't you care that that we're perishing. Don't you care? And Jesus wakes up, calms the storm. Why? Well, the storm had done its job. It had revealed what was actually in the hearts of God's people, the disciples. He calms the storm, then he turns to them and says, where was your faith? In other words, though you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, don't fear evil. 
I'm with you. And he literally physically was. He was literally physically in the boat. The miracle was not the calming of the storm. The miracle was a man of God sleeping with his head on a pillow in rest in the midst of a storm. That's a miracle. That's the miracle. Storms are going to come in life. But it says that he leads us. We know from Scripture very clearly that God leads his people. Second thing we know is that some of the ways that God has led his people. When we look at the Word of God, we can see that God leads people through dreams. He leads some people through visions. There's been audible voices. Sometimes there are angelic visitations. He spoke through a donkey once and still speaks through donkeys. Hang around long enough. He speaks to us through nature and creation. He speaks to us through the written word. He speaks to us through prophetic utterances. He speaks to us through circumstances. He can speak through us through wise counsel and and, and the the word of godly uh, friends and family. There are numerous ways, and we know because if you look at the word of God, there's there's an almost limitless way that God chooses uh, to speak to his people. We have examples of him speaking to people in so many different ways. And the third thing we know from Scripture is that we know he won't lead his people outside the boundaries of his word and his character. He's not going to lead us to a place outside of his word and his character. 1 John uh, chapter 5, verse 7 and 8. Now, depending on what translation you have here, it may say something different. Some translations combine verse 7 and 8 together into one. Some break it into two verses. But here's what it says. In the NIV, it says, For there are three, there are three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. Now, the NIV is probably not the best translation of that passage. Where it says the water, that word water is the Greek word logos, which actually means word, speak. Okay? Most other translations translate it differently. It'll say the spirit, the word, and the blood. But the point is this, that the Holy Spirit, which is the, the way that Jesus said in John 16, I'm going to go, because Jesus said, follow me. And so he physically led them. Then he said, I'm going to go. And they were sad about that. Well, what are we going to do now? He said, it's okay. I'm still going to be able to, to lead you, but I'm going to lead you through my spirit. John 16, when he comes, he will lead, he'll guide you into all truth. He will lead you. One of the Holy Spirit's number one ministries down here in the life of a believer is to lead us just as Jesus led the disciples. So we're not being left as orphans trying to stumble our way through with no protection, no direction. God says, I'll send my spirit and my spirit will lead you. But we know that he doesn't lead us outside the boundaries of his word and his character because the spirit, the word, and the blood, he says these three are in agreement. So if somebody comes along or you're feeling a sense of God saying, I, you know, I should, I should punch my brother in the face because I'm really angry at him. Well, I'm going to say that that's probably outside the boundaries of the word of God. I would probably ask the question, is that really you, Lord? You know? If you're feeling that you should upgrade or trade in your husband or your wife just because you want a sexier model, I'm going to suggest to you that's probably not what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Go back and say, is that really you, God? Because God's probably not saying that. There are a lot of things that people attribute to God that if they just got into the Word of God, which seems to be a dying art form these days, we just don't want to read it anymore. But if we got into the Word of God, a lot of our questions would be answered and our capacity and ability to understand what God is saying would be enhanced just by doing that simple discipline of getting into the Word of God. Amen? Just get into the Word of God because the Spirit of God will not contradict or go against the Word of God or the character and nature of our Heavenly Father. So there's three things we know that Scripture says. But what Scripture is not so clear on is how God is going to choose to lead you. It's not so clear on that. We just listed a whole bunch of different ways that God led people in the Word of God. And, and, and unfortunately, I haven't found a scripture that says, and Alan, when the Spirit comes, Alan, the Holy Spirit will lead you this particular way so you will know because this is your way. I can't find a verse that says that. But I do know this. I know he leads me. I know he, he has many different ways to lead. And I know he won't lead me outside the boundaries of the Word of God and the character and the nature of God. It's interesting to note that Jesus didn't teach his disciples how to be led by the Spirit per se. He didn't sit them down in a room and say, this is how it's going to happen. He just was led by the Spirit. They observed him being led by the Spirit, but he didn't specifically teach them how to be led by the Spirit, but he did tell them that the Spirit would lead them. Right? He didn't specifically say how the Spirit's going to lead them, but he made it very clear to them, but the Spirit will lead you. It's amazing when you go through the Word of God. It's amazing to me how many people were led by God in moments and times where they weren't even necessarily trying to be led by God. 
It's not like they were sitting in a room begging and pleading, Lord, you know, there's a few occasions there where they're praying for direction and God would come and give direction and would leave. But there are other times where God just kind of randomly appears and takes them on a course that they weren't heading on because that's his will for them. That's what he wanted. The point there is that sometimes I think we put too much pressure on ourselves to try to hear from God. We, we, we feel like we've got to try to make God speak to us. Well, if you're a parent of a child and your child has to try to make you speak to them, a good parent, we want to communicate with our kids. We want to speak to them. As a matter of fact, the onus of communication rests on the speaker, not just the hearer. I've said it before. If my, uh, I've, got, I've got four kids and they're all very different. And I kind of communicate different to them. But I communicate specifically to them and where they're at and their personality and all that kind of thing. But I communicate in a way I know they're going to get it. Right? I've got, I've got, I've got uh, uh, you know, kids that I, I, I just got to you know, look at them. And that says a thousand words. They know exactly what dad is saying. I'm just going like this, you know. Then I've got others that this doesn't work. They just think, dad, you've got to twitch while they keep doing the dumb thing they're doing. So I've got to communicate different to them. So maybe I've got to get alongside them and you know, be really nice and really gentle. I go, oh, look, I really think you need to, you know, have you thought about it? And they get it that way and they respond. But then I've got other ones of my kids that if I did that, they'd look at me and go, what's wrong with you, dad? And keep it. They still wouldn't get it. So I've got to just get in their face and go, hey, stop it. And they go, oh, I get it now. Now, whether they do it or not is another thing, but they get it. The point is we speak a language that our kids understand. You would know that as husbands and wives. You, you get to know one another. And you kind of know how to communicate things, don't you? you know? Kids know how to communicate things to get what they want. That's why they pick a, a different parent because they know, you know, that there's, there's all these dynamics that go on when it comes to communication. But effective communication is not about what I'm saying, it's about what you're hearing. So if I'm a good communicator, I'm thinking about what you're going to hear when I say this. So I'm trying to say this in a way that you hear what I'm trying to say. And God's a better communicator than me, amen? And so God does the same thing too. So while he didn't teach the disciples how to be led, he told them very clearly that you would be led. Um, John chapter 10, I want to have a quick look at this this morning. John chapter 10, verse 1 to 5. And Jesus sa it says this. Jesus has got a, a group of religious leaders, the Pharisees there. He says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, he's a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. And who's the good shepherd? Jesus. He says the gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. Who's the sheep? Everyone go, bah. Where the sheep? He's the shepherd. He says the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Isn't that beautiful? It's not just this blanket, hey, you bunch of revelly sheep woolly things, come this way. It says he calls them by name. Now, I'm not a farmer. My grandparents used to be farmers, but I have been told this. It's very dangerous to name a cow or a sheep or something. You don't want to name them, do you, when they're little? Because then you get kind of too attached to them when they're older and you've got to turn them into rump steaks. You don't sort of want the emotional attachment. But Jesus calls them by name. It says he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. He leads them. He calls them and he's taking them somewhere. He leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them. And the sheep follow him. Watch this, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So he tells us that as believers, we're going to know his voice, right? That word know, when it says he's going to know his voice, it's a very broad Greek word, edo, and it means this. It means to perceive by any of the senses. So, so when we think the word voice, we think this is how you pick up a voice, right? If someone speaks, you hear because it's an audible thing. But the Greek word there is, is, is not limited to that. The Greek word means you can perceive it by any very number of senses. So sometimes you might, you might hear an audible voice. Sometimes you might see something that's the, the leading of God. Sometimes you may sense or feel something that's the leading of God. 
You might observe something that's the leading of God. It's saying that there's many different ways that God can speak to us. The trick is not trying to work that out, like trying to tell God this is how you have to speak to me. The trick is to recognize his voice when he does. That's the journey. It's learning to recognize the voice of God because God is speaking to you. He does speak to us in many and varied ways. So this is the Christian journey, to learn how to recognize the voice of the Spirit in our day-to-day lives and then have the faith to obey it. Christianity is not overly complicated. It's not overly complicated. It's not about, you know, make sure you memorize you know, three New Testament passages a month and make sure you can, you know, know this doctrine and that doctrine. It, it's, a, 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 it, it's, a, it's not a stagnant thing. It's a, it's a flowing thing. Our relationship with God, our growth in God, it, it, it happens without participation. It happens without participation as we learn to recognize the voice of God. Just like Julius, all these voices coming at him, one of them was the voice of God, but he didn't discern the right voice. Just like that young lady on the YWAM school, all these voices coming at her, but she failed to discern the right voice. She didn't listen to the right voice, and it cost her. So the Christian life is a journey, learning how to recognize the voice of the Spirit in our day-to-day lives and obeying it. So what I want to do in the time left, I want to give you two things, very simple things that I think will help us as believers to recognize the voice of God in the midst of all the different voices that we're getting bombarded with every single day. Two very simple things. Here's, here's the first one. The first one is this. Position yourself to recognize his voice. It's very simple. Make sure that you are positioning yourself to actually hear the voice of God, to recognize and to discern the voice of God. Position yourself in the right place in order to hear the voice of God. Acts chapter 13 and verse, verse 2. There's a little, little verse here that kind of kick-started the missionary service of Paul when Paul was released and started going on his missionary journeys with Barnabas. And it says this, it says, While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, they're not sitting down praying, saying, God, who shall we send? God, who, who, are the, who are the two that, you know? It, it says they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. In the Greek, it means just performing a natural, normal duty as we did this morning. We ministered to the Lord through our worship. We're just ministering to God. So when we come in and worship, we're not sitting through worship going, oh, Lord, what do you want to say to me? No, no, that's not, that's not the time. It's not about you. Worship is not about you. Do you benefit from worship? Yes. Do we get something out of worship? Yes. But is it about us? No. It's about God. It's about God. I was sitting there this morning and thinking, I've got some things running through my head. I've got a busy week coming up. And at one point, I found myself getting kind of distracted and, and thinking, well, you know, God, why, why, why has this happened? And why has that happened? And I just felt that gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit. Alan, later, this is not about you. Get up and worship. So if I had to get up and lift my voice, and, 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 and as David said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. He didn't want to do it, but he spoke to himself. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. It says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit spoke to them and he said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. See, we don't try to hear the voice, we position ourselves to hear his voice. And worship is one way that we position ourselves to hear the voice of God. Some of the basic, I mean, these are no, this is no-brainer stuff, right? I wish that there were more complex and, and sophisticated ways that we could grow in faith and grow in our relationship with God and become all he wants us to become. I wish there were more technical and, you know, new, you know I, I just wish it was more complicated than this, uh, but it's actually very, very simple. And you could preach the same things every single week, 52 weeks of the year. It doesn't matter how often you preach it or how often I talk about it. How often do I do it? How often do I do it? And we position ourselves through worship. We position ourselves in prayer. We position ourselves to recognize the voice of God by being people who pray. People who pray. Oh, I wonder if we surveyed this room right now and, 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 and said, okay, how, mu- how many people have prayed this week, number one? And then how many people have spent more than 10 minutes this week praying? How many people have thought about prayer but thought, well, when I've got time, and then realized that you ran out of time because prayer wasn't a priority, everything else was a priority? Because at the end of the day, my day I'm going to look back on today. And today will be the sum total of what I prioritized. I can tell myself whatever I want. It will be the sum total of whatever I prioritized. Now, things happen. I'm not trying to be black and white and legalistic here. But at the end of the day, that's that's basically where it falls. I get to the end of the day and say, I didn't have any time to pray. Well, I'm lying to myself. I did. Could have got up 10 minutes earlier. Might have been really tired. Might have been really drowsy. Uh, Might have been inconvenient for me, but I could have done it. I could have turned off the football 
and just gone and prayed. But I didn't. I chose to sit there and watch my beloved Tigers get absolutely thumped again. My choice. Silly man. When will I learn? Would have been way better, trust me, spending that time in prayer. But we position ourselves in prayer. We, we learn to recognize the voice of God when we're people of prayer. When we get into the Word of God, when we get into the Word of God, we position ourselves to be people that begin to recognize the voice of God. Because the voice of God sound, it sounds a lot like that. Ooh, well. You told me something about you, I'll tell you later. It's my wife, I'm joking. But the Word of God, the voice of the Spirit sounds a lot. It sounds a lot like that. Are we people that position ourselves to recognize his voice by being people who get into the word of God? The the other thing they did here, it says, is they worshipped and fasted. Fasting is this old, archaic, religious thing that we don't need to do anymore. And, you know, no, it's not. Get into the word of God. Have a look. As a matter of fact, if you're a a member of a connect group here in the life of our eyes, you are eventually, within the next 12 months, you'll be doing a a little Bible study on fasting. We're going to get all our connect groups to do it. Because uh, as a leadership, we did this um, uh, thing about three, four months ago. And, and I can tell you now, everyone on leadership in, in this church, we fast one day every single week. Because we've seen the benefits and we've experienced it and we've got into the Word of God together and we know how powerful fasting is. And it positions you. And you begin to, to recognize the voice of God with a bit more clarity than maybe you did before. It's amazing that the simple things just don't seem to change. You know? Right in the beginning, in the story of the early church in the book of Acts, he says they devoted themselves to, to the apostles' doctrine, to, uh, to, the, you know, to the word of God, to prayer, to fellowship. They just positioned themselves for great things to happen and to discern and recognize the voice of God. And that's the other one, fellowship. You're, just by being here today, you're positioning yourself to recognize more and more the voice of God. You're positioning yourself. Uh, any, any surfers in the room? Anyone surf? Yep. Uh, I, I used to surf. I've got drop foot now in my right foot. I, I, I had a uh, thing happen and I can't lift my, 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 my right foot properly. But, um, but when, I remember when I did surf, you'd go out there and, and, and you know, surfing's all about being in the right position. You can be sitting over here by yourself and over there there's a hundred guys. But they're sitting there for a reason. That's where it's peaking. That's where the wave's going to be caught. And you've got these guys sitting over here, and, 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 and they can get frustrated and angry because, well, look at all the waves they're getting. Well, you can get a wave too. Just paddle over there and get in the right spot and position yourself, and you might get a wave as well. It's like when you're fishing and a guy's thrown over here and he's complaining the whole day I'm not getting anything, and you've brought 30 fish in over this side. So we'll stop whinging about it. Cast over this side, and you'll probably catch a fish too. You'll probably get it because the fish are over here. Life is about positioning ourselves. And when we want to learn to recognize the voice of God, we need to position ourselves in order to do that. And I can't come up with anything other than the basic tenets of Christianity as being the best ways to position yourself to learn to recognize the voice of God. And the second thing, look inward for the peace of God that comes with his voice. Look inward for the peace of God that comes with his voice. Ezekiel 36, verse 26 to 27. This is Ezekiel prophesying about the Holy Spirit coming. If you've been around a rise long enough, this verse comes up every second week. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. This is what happens when we surrender our lives to Jesus. He says, I'll give you a new heart and I'll put a new spirit in you. you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I came, I came to faith, I, I obviously had a heart of stone, but when I came to Jesus, he took that out and he gave me a heart of flesh. I could feel again. I could have compassion again. I could, I could recognize things. I, I, all of a sudden, I saw beauty and joy in things that up to that point, I never saw beauty and joy in. Because he changed my heart. He gave me a new heart. And then he says, and then I'll put my spirit, where? In you. I'm going to put my spirit in you. And I'm going to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. So it's not about external observance to a bunch of written codes. It's this internal, that the spirit inside of me is the one that is pushing me towards those things. It's not like I'm striving to try to be good. The spirit is making me good. I'm I'm not striving externally to try to keep all these rules and laws. As the spirit takes hold of my life and I listen to the spirit, before I know it, I'm doing some of these things. Not because I'm looking at a rule book going, I have to. It's just happening because I'm being conformed into the image of Jesus. The Spirit is leading me in line with his word. They're in agreement. They're in agreement, right? So the Spirit is inside of us. 
If you're born again, then you've got the Spirit, and the Spirit is doing His job in your life. He's doing it. He's speaking to you, He's leading you, He's guiding you, etc. Because the Holy Spirit's inside of you, then the place where the Spirit's voice will reverberate from the clearest is going to be inside of you. You ever, you ever, you ever have people say, we've got this saying that people say, oh, just trust your gut. Have you heard that? Just trust your gut. I think there's, there, there, there's an element of, of, of truth in that. There's an element of truth in that. We were going through a, a situation uh, some time back with one of our kids, and it's a long story, but I remember we sat with a, a, a counsellor one time through this traumatic period, and we sat with a counsellor, and this counsellor was not even a believer. And I'm, I'm saying to this counsellor, here's what the doctors are saying, here's what the psychologists are saying, here's what everyone's saying, but me and my wife, we're feeling this. And I was thinking that, of course, you know, they're non-Christian. They're just... but, but the counsellor, she said to me, here's the deal. She said, you know your kids better than any counsellor or any psychologist. Psych- you know your kid better. And if you're feeling that, her exact words to me were, I think you should trust your gut. And so we did. The next seven days, we threw out all the other stuff, trusted our gut. And that situation totally, by the grace and miracle of God, turned around to this day. Because we trusted our gut. That woman on the swing... I, I knew I knew that she didn't want to do that. I knew that there was something inside of her that wasn't comfortable with that. I'm saying to her, back yourself. Trust your gut. Listen to what's going on on the inside. Why? Because that's where the Holy Spirit is. It's not going to be a good thing. It's not going to end well. But she listened to all these other voices. And she didn't back herself. She didn't listen to that voice on the inside. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 16, Paul writes this. He says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, I love that. So we put to death the misdeeds of the body by the Spirit, not by willpower, not by trying to focus on rules. No, no, by allowing that Spirit inside of us, listening to that Spirit, learning to be led and guided by that Spirit. He said that's how you put to death the deeds of the flesh. Verse 14, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves. In other words, he doesn't force you to do things. He guides and leads like a GPS. A GPS says, turn left at the next street, roundabout. You don't have to do it. You can keep going. (laughs) And you know what? The GPS just recalibrates and gives you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance. It doesn't go, you idiot. You missed the turn. Well, go on with you, you know? I speak to my GPS that way, but my GPS never speaks back to me that way. says, the spirit you receive doesn't make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him, watch this, we cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Everyone, everyone read, say that? The spirit testifies with your spirit. The spirit that lives in you, that God said I'll place in you, he says that spirit testifies with your spirit when? And what does that spirit say? It says, Abba, Father. It tells us we're God's children. What he's saying is when we come to faith and that spirit comes in us, there's this sense in which it's almost like the Holy Spirit comes into you and goes, hi, hi, Jackie, I'm the Holy Spirit and we are now one. It's like this introduction takes place and, and, and the Spirit witnesses with our spirit and we know that we know that we know I don't know how because I'm the same person now that I was five minutes ago but I'm actually not the same person. I'm a new creation now and the Spirit comes in and in the very beginning, the first way that the Spirit communicates anything to you, the first thing from the inside is He says to you, you are now God's child. And that's a principle that we need to learn to follow from that point on that when that Spirit witnesses with our spirit, that word in the Greek, uh, witnesses, it literally is the word symmetreo. It's, it's where we get the root word symmetry from. In other words, there's a symmetry that happens between the Holy Spirit and your spirit. And what is the result of that symmetry? Peace. Peace. You feel that sense of peace on the inside of you. I heard a, a, a wise man or woman come in who it was one day use this phrase. They said, let peace be the umpire. Let peace be the umpire. How do we know it's gone? Well, I'm always looking for that sense of peace on the inside of me because my spirit and the Holy Spirit are cohabitating in here. And if I don't have that sense of peace, that tells me that these two spirits are not in alignment and the Holy Spirit is always right and I'm not. So it's got to be me that's out of alignment here. It can't be God. Maybe what I'm thinking of doing is wrong and the Spirit's in me going, not a good choice. Maybe I'm thinking of taking that direction. The Spirit's going, not a good direction. Maybe I want to go and say that, and the Spirit's going, not a good thing to say. There's no peace here. 
So I've learned in those moments to not act when I don't have that sense of peace, that cohesion. You ever walk into somebody's house and, and you know, the minute you walk in the door, you feel the tension in the home? Anyone ever, you know, you, you just come to visit somebody and you just straight away go, oh, this is bad time. You, you want to sort of back out the door and disappear, but you don't want to embarrass anyone. But you can feel the tension in the home when there's disunity in the room. Well, it's the same thing for us. We feel the tension, that lack of peace when there's disunity between the Holy Spirit and our spirit. We feel that inside of us. Acts chapter 15, verse 28, when the disciples were making a decision, should the Gentiles have to follow all the rules of the law, i.e., should all the men be circumcised in order to follow Jesus? Right? Now, praise God that they came to this decision. It says that they decided, no, you don't have to. Just avoid sexual immorality and don't eat meat, sacrifice idols, or filled with blood. But here's how they came to that conclusion. In Acts 15, 28, they said, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Not to burden you with anything beyond the following. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. There was a seemingness about it. Okay, in my spirit, it seems good to the Spirit. seems good to me. I've got peace about this decision. I've got peace about this course of action. I've got a sense of peace that this is the right next step to take. And if I don't have that sense of peace, that means that it doesn't seem so good to me or the Spirit. There's a disharmony there. And if we just learn to trust that sense, and I'm, I'm speaking to believers, if you are not a believer in Jesus, if you've never surrendered your life to God, I don't think the Holy Spirit dwells in you, he, but I do believe the Holy Spirit is around you. And I do believe the Holy Spirit leads you, but he won't be leading you from the inside because he hasn't taken up habitation there yet because you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. Your sin has not been dealt with. Well, it has been. You've just not accepted it. But if you're a believer here, there's a synergy that happens between the spirit and my spirit, and we're always looking for that peace. Amen? We've got to look for that peace. And if I don't have that peace, here's my encouragement. Don't rush out and act on it. Wait. Get back with God. Sit. Get some counsel. Get into the word. Pray a bit. Whatever you've got to do. But don't rush off without that sense of peace. Because the Spirit is in us, and that's one of the primary ways that the Spirit will communicate with us is that sense of peace. So at the end of the day, how do you really know that you're being led by the Holy Spirit? I was watching the movie Twist. I'll get the band back now. Come back up. We're going to finish with that song. I was watching the movie Twister. Anyone remember that old movie Twister? Remember, they've just remade it, apparently. There's a new version, and I, I love the original versions of just about everything better than the remakes, but... There's this, this moment where, where, where they're in, a, in the um, van and they're chasing after the storm and there's one group that's going and there's another group coming. And they're both sort of racing. And they get along the road at a certain point and they stop. And the main character tells the driver, stop. And he stops. And the other guys just whiz past them heading over that direction. And they said, what are you doing? And he said, turn right, go down here. And they're looking at their charts and they go, no, 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 that's, that's not right. Because all the charts, everything is telling us the storm's going to be down there. We've got to go, let's go. And he goes, no, no, no. Turn right here, it's got to go down there. And they're going, no. And he says, listen, just do it. And they said this thing, they said, how did you know? How do you know? And he responded this way, he just said, I just know. What a deep answer. <laughs> I just know. You see, the implication there, the, what, what, what he was saying was, I've been chasing storms for so long. And I've learned some things. Sometimes I got it right. And probably sometimes I got it wrong. But I've been doing this for so long that I'm actually now beginning to learn how to find those storms. I just know. And when it comes to following the voice of the Holy Spirit, here's my encouragement. The more you commit yourself to following the Spirit, the more you commit yourself to going, okay, God, I'm gonna, I, I want to be led by you. And the more you commit yourself to that and begin to step out in faith, you're going you're to get it wrong a lot of times. But you're going to get it right too. And when, and when you get it wrong and you get it right, you learn from both. And you start to understand what it is and how the Spirit speaks to you individually. You start to discern, okay, so this is kind of what you're saying. This is, this is the way you lead. This is the way you, you don't. And it comes because we just begin to commit to doing it. 
Some of us sit back and we're waiting for God. We're like Peter saying, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come. And Jesus says, okay, come. And then you go, okay, well, if it's really you, Lord, make three flying fish go over the bow of the boat. And so he does. And you go, well, that's pretty good. Now, if it really is you, make a humpback whale jump off the stern. And we're just sitting there because we, we're never going to back ourselves. We're never going to step out in faith. We're never going to trust God. One of my favorite verses of Scripture is Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, For without faith, it's impossible to please God. Have you ever thought about that? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because he who comes to him must believe that he is. First, I've got to believe he's there. It also says that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. God's there and he's a, he rewards those that push into him, that come after him. But I love that statement that without faith it's impossible to please God. But I know this about God. My God wants me to live a life that's pleasing to him. Which means he's going to make sure there's enough room that I constantly need faith. He's not going to, ta- he's not going to get me to a point where I'm going, I don't need faith anymore. I saw the three birds go over the top. I saw the whale jump. Jesus said, I, uh, you know, I went... And so now I just know that I 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 know. Those moments have been very few and far between in my journey with God. It's always been a sense of, I believe, I think this is God. But there's a point where God goes, well, what are you going to do with that now? Are you going to step out in faith? Are you going to trust me? Go back and read Exodus chapter 3. Look at the story of Moses. Think of all the things that Moses did to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And in Exodus chapter 3, God actually says this to Moses. Because we all know Moses' stories back and forth. They're going to you know, get someone else. I'm not smart enough. I can't talk. Blah, blah, blah. And God actually says, yeah, I think I've got it written it down, actually. Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 and 12. I don't know if I'll put it up there. God says, so now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Look at God's response. I wouldn't be happy with this. I'd be frustrated. God said, I'll be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out. (laughs) What? (laughs) Hang on, I want a sign before I bring the people out, God. God says, this will be the sign. You're going to go through all that stuff, and there's still going to be a little bit of doubt in there as to whether this is me. He says, when you brought them out, then you'll stand on this mountain, And you worship me. And the penny will drop. And you'll go, that was really you, God. We want the penny to drop before we go down the hill and confront Pharaoh. Think about that next time you read the story of the Exodus. Amen? Let's be people that want to be led by the Spirit. Let's be people that back ourselves and trust ourselves. Get wise counsel. Here's a simple general rule. If, it's, if God's saying to me, just give 10 bucks to my mother-in-law. I'm saying, Lord, that's not going to be enough. She won't be happy with that. It's got to be. And that's a joke. God tells me to go and give you know, 50 bucks to Dave. Well, I don't need huge confirmations about that. I feel peaceful about that. He's already told me to be generous. I'll go and do that. If God tells me to tell my wife we're packing everything up and moving to China next Monday to be missionaries. Well, there's a greater level of consequence for that one if I get it wrong. So now I'm going, okay, Lord, you've got to speak to her. Now we're going to go and we're going to talk to some people. And God, we, we need some more confirmations and stuff to kind of build that sense of peace about that. So I'm not just saying that if you're sitting there now and you feel like, oh, wow, I really feel like I should go and buy a brand new Maserati, but I've got no money. I'm not going to tell my wife about it. No, that's not the spirit. I'm not saying do that. I feel peaceful. No, don't do it. What I am saying now is we have to cultivate an attitude of trust in God and start backing ourselves. How many miracles do we miss out on? How many testimonies do we not have because we just play it so safe? Because we live by what our intellect says, our emotions say, and we don't listen to the voice of the very God that Jesus said, I'm going to place in you. He's going to guide you, lead you. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to finish by singing this song. Hey, please don't run off. We've got tea and coffee next door. We've got the barbecue out there and so on as well. Uh, let me just pray for us real quick. So, Father, thank you for your uh, word, Lord. But I want to thank you this morning for the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you for the presence of God. Lord, I want to thank you for, uh, uh, God, your word that you've given to us. 
that you have preserved for generations, Lord. When people have tried to wipe it out, you've preserved it so that we can have it here now. But God, your spirit that you said you would place inside each one of us that believe in you, Father. God, I thank you for that spirit. God, I thank you that the Holy Spirit, my body is a temple and the spirit dwells in this temple, Lord. And each person in this room that's given their life to Jesus, their body is a temple and that temple is filled with the Holy Spirit as we speak. God, I pray as we leave this place, Lord, that we would listen more and more to the voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us. God, we live in a culture that tells us what's best. God, we're surrounded by people that that tell us what's best based on their own experience maybe or their own hurts or disappointments or whatever it might be, God. We have so many voices coming at us with so many agendas and angles. But the Holy Spirit leads us to quiet waters and fruitful places. Lord, you lead us through valleys of shadows of death. Father, you lead us to good things, Lord, and we want to learn as a people to listen and then to have the faith to step out and obey and trust. And Lord, we're going to get it wrong. I know we are. But God, there's grace for that. But Father, each time we get it wrong, we're one time closer to the time we're going to get it right. When we get it right, the glory that you get out of that, Lord, is worth it. So Father, bless your people this morning, Lord, as we leave this place, God, I pray. Uh, For the next seven days, give us an opportunity to tell someone about you, Lord. There are people out there that don't know the good news of Jesus. And God, give us the chance to speak the good news to somebody that does not know you, that doesn't know you loved them, doesn't know you died for them yet. Bless us, God, with the opportunity to share that. 